I'm Dr. Katherine Evans. I'm with the psychology department, uh, professor of psychology, and also acting associate dean for the faculty. I think the most uh, important word is community. What do we mean by community? And it's a community in the classroom. Uh, community is um, usually, I think of it as a social system. As a psychologist, I think of it as a social system that uh, connects people together for some common purpose, uh, some reason, and certainly in the classroom it's for the meta goal of learning, whatever that might be. And uh, as a community, we want to be able to meet uh, certain needs and provide an environment in which learning can occur uh, in a constructive relational way. People are um, excited to come. Uh, they're, they're good to go to come to that class. They feel connected to other people in the class. They feel a sense of ownership of uh, whatever the learning uh, objectives of the course might be. Uh, they feel safe uh, enough to explore, safe enough to be wrong, um, and challenged enough to grow. Just an overall ethos of I'm, I'm here and I belong here and I have a responsibility to the other people in the class. It's not just the professor's uh, class. It's my class. It's our class. I think I'm going to kind of take a step back and say I, I think I first started re realizing that um, community was a way to try to make a difference uh, in people's experience with higher education um, by paying attention to the relational nature of learning. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, just the you know, the tradition of our educational system in the United States tends to be extrinsically motivated. So it's for the grade. People learn things so that they get some outcome, some goodie at the end. Um, and maybe that sometimes doesn't work, isn't enough. Uh, and oftentimes people um, forget that learning actually has an intrinsic value. And I think community is a way to help people begin to take responsibility and ownership of uh, the classroom, of the learning process, of saying, you know, I need, I'm an element of this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a part of the dynamic. And that if this class isn't going well, uh, I, I really need to be looking at myself and to say, what am I doing to contribute or not contribute to this uh, learning experience, this learning um, environment. So uh, I think it's important in terms of um, the, the whole sense of, of um, locus of control, intrinsic motivation. Uh, we also know that cooperative learning is a, a very powerful way for people to go beyond just surface learning. Uh, deep learning occurs through cooperative learning. And uh, I think having that happen in community is a, um, using the community model as a way of um, allowing cooperative learning to take place, uh, that it feeds each other. Uh, the other thing about uh, learning communities, I think, is that it's not just about academic learning. It's also about social uh, learning and emotional learning. So in some ways we're expanding our understanding of what we're trying to do in the classroom. And those are, those are things that uh, we have elementary education teachers working on. High school teachers often have that uh, in their um, rubrics for their uh, lesson plans. And I think in higher education sometimes we think that our students have arrived already. And uh, my experience is that often they, they haven't. They're still in process. And so paying it, I think we do them a good service by uh, providing this kind of um, 
experiential learning uh, that focuses on uh, emotional and, and social uh, intelligences as well. Being very transparent about the purpose of uh, a learning community classroom that this isn't just my classroom, it's their classroom as well. There are certain non-negotiables. I'm just very upfront with that. Uh, it's in my syllabus, we talk about it the first day, that uh, there are certainly goals and objectives that are non-negotiable, but how the class wants to achieve those goals uh, and objectives uh, it is negotiable and depends upon the nature and of their relationship with each other and with the material. So you know, right out of the gate I'm inviting them to become part of the community. Uh, I also spend time working on trying to illustrate for them, have them have those aha experiences where they realize the limitations of their own learning, the limitations of their own perspectives, and how much richer uh, their learning can be by involving other people and listening to other people's perspectives. So it has um, both ex an expansive uh, nature to it and as well as a limiting nature to it and that that insight is really important. Um, so I try to build in ways that they do group projects, um, the group discussions, that they have some ownership. It's not just me that's responsible for the outcome of the discussion. Um, I will model for them the kinds of things that I would like to see them do um, in involving each other uh, in a discussion. And I also do some uh, mini lectures, I guess, about community and about roles that uh, uh, so they understand a little bit better about you know there are task roles, there are process roles that people who make sure that people who aren't speaking are invited uh, to participate that that is a very important role as part of the community and um, has value. Um, so often through experiential um, activities, the um, way that I have them interact with each other, uh, the uh, expectations that I try to set up for the class, all of those I think are ways that I try to build community. What you are about to see is the second classroom period for a class called Concepts of Community. It is an honors course and I think that that's important to keep in mind. And this is a cohort for the most part. There are 24 students and of that, those 24, 22 of them started the honors program together. There are two people that have just joined um, the group. So the interaction uh, may be more familiar than you would expect for a class that's just in its second period. And we're going to, um, I'm going to stretch them a little bit because I'm going to give them an experiential um, activity. And these are honor students who are used to being very successful in cognitive activities that are deductive. And I'm asking them to have an inductive experience. A structure for our experiences today. Okay. So, uh, to that end, let me, I'm going to actually put something in the center. And here are the rules. And the rules are that you follow the rules. <laughs> Secondly, that uh, you don't get up and move around. You stay exactly where you are seated at this point, And you um, uh, will, you're going to get a piece of paper out and you're going to describe what you see from uh, wherever you are in the room. And I'm going to ask you not to move or talk to other people yet. We're going to do that as a kind of second step. So here's our concrete experience. And your mission, should you
accept it is to describe what you see. <coughs> Describe what you see, then answer the question, what does it mean? Let's hear from any of you who want to read what you wrote in your first part, the first question, what do you see? Sure. I see that hand. <laughs> right. I see a block of wood with a carving on it. I cannot see most of the carving, but on the back there's a cross etch in it, and there appears to be two heads or something on the front, and it's a darker wood. And some holes on the side closest to me. It's about a foot, foot tall and seven inches long, and it looks like a snake. And I made a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see wood that's generally shaped like a cross, well, not like a traditional Christian cross per se, but it has a general shape. Um, and there are three figures standing in a line, kind of facing towards me, um, with the first person in the front being the shortest, and then taller, and then taller. Um, and the person in the front has his arms down. The second person line has his arms straight out, forming like the transept of the cross. And then the person in the last line has pretty much a big O over his head, his arms are all forming an O. Um, as if this was some other word, but we were singing the YMCA song. <laughs> um, I said from my perspective, it's interpretation of it was that the man, it was kind of like Jesus's journey through life. So the man in the front is him living, and then the guy on the cross is him dying, and then there's like a figure at the top, and I could only see like a head shape, but I figured like the crescent shape was like a cloud or something, and that was him in heaven. I think I took it a little differently um, just because I'm um, thinking that we're in a community class, so obviously it has to have something to do with community. Um, <laughs> probably a bad assumption. Um, but just kind of looking at it, I kind of took it like here we have three different people, and somehow they're kind of unified in the cross, unified with Christ, and kind of like that has a um, metaphor for what the Christian church is like, how um, as Christians are unified with Christ in his death, um, and how since you have three different people, it's not just one person alone, but as a community. As the church, we're all kind of unified into that cross. So that's why I kind of like with it. Anyone noticing where the conversation is happening in terms of meaning? Okay. So what's going on over here? I said. <laughs> <laughs> You're not over there, but that's okay. <laughs> what? Oh, that's fine. Is that, please. I thought I was still sort of on the back. Yeah, side that's of it. fine. But oh, I said. It means something significant and monumental. A cataclysm of dynamicness inside the soul. I'm on the wrong side. To fully comprehend its significance. It implies time and contemplation on the part of its creator, either of a sublime epiphany or of shallow ununderstanding, depending upon the religious state of the creator. <laughs> Let's go back to the question about what do you 
see, right? And uh, you see in part, yes? So we're having this conversation about people and heads and all of this kind of thing, and you're going, what, ho-hum? Uh, what, what's going on? Yeah, I guess I just, I didn't really, you know, especially because I didn't know the context of the art or the artist, I just had trouble discerning, you know, much from any other bit. I mean, maybe you could see, you know, an image of a cross etched in there somewhere, but I didn't understand how it pertained to the rest of it. Okay. So you were kind of, you, you went as far as you could, and then that was kind of it. Yeah. Right. And what did you want to do? Leave it. See what else was on the other side. Um, I, I guess just uh, you know knowing more about the context of it, it would have helped. You know, knowing who the artist was or what you know a little bit of what they were trying to accomplish. I think even if I had a different angle, I wouldn't have been able to discern much more. Mm -hmm. So you wanted context, you said. Like, yes. You wanted more context. Okay. I hope that you're having a similar experience in the sense of what is this. What are you seeing that you don't see it uh, in its fullness? You want context. You have a perspective that's limited. Right? And uh, we move from what do we see into what we mean, oftentimes with incomplete uh, knowledge. So we, we draw conclusions without having a chance to really understand what it is that we see from it in terms of its fullness. And so uh, you need each other to be able to do that. Right? So when you were listening to people's descriptions, I'm going back. So when you were listening to people's descriptions of what they were seeing, any observations? Any ahas as you were listening? <coughs> Well, I mean, from my perspective, I can't really see anything. So, I mean, other than the three heads and everything, they're kind of in a level row. Um, so I can't really say, I'm not really in a position to judge if one is right or wrong. And not knowing the context, we can't really say that either. So, I mean, it kind of just leaves all options. There's room for discernment. Oh, that's another word that has come up more than once, discernment. Is that kind of a... Christian cultural word? Does it have special meaning to us? I see you in the head nodding. Yeah. Out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> okay. What does it mean? Give it to us, Courtney. Um, my understanding of discernment is being able to tell right from wrong or holy from unholy in the Christian context. So how are you, is that how you were using the word? Yeah, kind of okay. clear cut answer. Ah, okay. So uh, we want to ask right and wrong. We want to ask, we want to know without doubt. That's generally what we mean by um, thinking of things in absolutes. Is it absolutely true? Is it absolutely false? And yet here is an object that is sufficiently vague enough, depending on upon where you're, you are sitting, that uh, it becomes a little more complicated, right? So uh, what else might have been, uh, you know, I named the Christian uh, ethos, right, under which you are looking at this object. Danny was willing to say, well, it, it's, you were acknowledging what the cross means. And that that's an image that we, we imbue on this object quite quickly. Did you not? And you said, there's a cross. Not uh, a wood that intersects at right angles. So the point is that you bring experience. Right? You bring experience to whatever it is that you are looking at and your individual experience. 
influences your perspective. And maybe even the questions that you're asking. What's the right answer? So you have uh, individual experience. And hopefully in reading, if you've had a chance to read the chapter 12 in your um, block book, you also know that you bring gifts, ways of seeing. So as you look at what you wrote, what might be the gift that you brought? Is that too big? <coughs> a way of seeing. No. It's wanting to capture that image. It doesn't necessarily, we're not going to talk about whether it's right or wrong. We're not going to talk about whether it's good or bad. Just the motivation to do that. So, uh, how many of you sort of went right to that basic high school chemistry experiment where you were given a candle and you had to describe what was going on in the candle and you had to be totally objective and describe, don't interpret, but describe. So how many of you approached this assignment that way? Uh, how many of you chose to come at it from a more sen a more intuitive approach. One or two of you. Are you trained to be logical and you know, objective in your response, right? Sure. So and yet there that that's not there's no wrong to that. Uh, and for Christina to approach it in a more intuitive way, there's no wrong in that. Matter of fact, that's a gift. She brings that, uh, that richness to us. And maybe gives us permission to do that as well. So we can't know this object uh, in its entirety without being able to understand context, without being able to understand how other people are perceiving it. And thirdly, we need to recognize what our gifts and limitations are in, uh, in observing and experiencing this object. Reactions. Um, I was just thinking about the fact that we're all different majors here. So the perspective of kind of what we've been trained in so far has kind of kicked in a little bit. So take, for example, like, is Kristen here? I don't think so. She's in art. Or where is she? I'm sorry, Kristen is. <laughs> Kristen is in art. So she's going to look more at probably the art aspect of this. You have Danny who's in philosophy. Danny's going to take the philosophical, which he did. I almost predicted that. Um, <laughs> Sam, if he was over here, he'd probably look at more maybe a literary aspect or more of an artistic point of view. Rob, buddy, <laughs> computer science. You're going to take a very logical, by-the-book look at it. So I just think it's kind of interesting just to see how we take these different points of view from the major and kind of work it into this even more. Mm -hmm. Wait, see. Yeah. And that we embrace that. Other reactions? I found it at least a little bit frustrating until people um, started describing what was on the other side. Mm -hmm. Just because for me, I just really wanted to see the whole picture because all I can see from this side are just two bumps on the side and maybe a crossover on this side that's really vague. And so that experience was a little bit frustrating for me trying to figure out what it was and um, trying to figure out what it means. And I wasn't able to see the whole picture, so it was. Yeah, frustrating was probably the best word to describe it, but once people started describing it, I was able to sort of imagine it and, I don't know, made me more at peace with it, sort of. Even though I'm not able to see it now, I can sort of picture it in my mind, and so 
it makes it a little bit better of an experience. Can I ask you a couple more questions about that frustration? Yeah. Uh, how did you respond to the frustration? Because I think this experience uh, does a couple things. One is on the personal level. I'm going to talk right over your head. Sorry. Um, on the personal level, it says something about the aha in terms of the ways that you approach an assignment like this. Where do you go? What kind of a, approach are you using? And then, of course, the uh, broader experience of saying, I can't understand this by myself. I need uh, more information. Where do I go with that for, for that information? Do I go to others? Do I go to the person who made this? Do I, wh where do I go for that? And I think in, in some respects, I'm going to make a, a, a rash comment now, and that is our educational system tends to focus on individual work. Right? So you tend to go alone to find these things. And in this class, I'm open to having you work together. We can talk about what that means and the limits of that uh, later on. The point is to understand uh, this particular object, you need to hear from each other. Um, and the concept of the circle here and I'm going to bring this to actually, kind of, I, I like the word foreshadowing, I don't know why, but I like the word foreshadowing. And uh, the Lakota culture uh, makes a big deal about something called the medicine wheel. These are supposed to be rocks. <laughs> <laughs> And there are four directions. Actually, there are seven directions, but mostly people will talk about the four directions. Uh, north, south, east, west. Uh, and the concept is uh, important in terms of our development. That everyone is born somewhere on this circle, the circle of life. And that you, where you are born is dictated by the gifts that you are given by the Creator and um, the experiences that you are going to have. And it formulates a way of seeing. So gifts are really as much about how you engage with the world, your, uh, your way of seeing. I, that I keep coming back to that. And uh, it, briefly, the East is represented by the Eagle. And uh, they often will talk about the, it is the source of illumination. That's where the sun comes from, right? And that you can see the whole picture. You know, the eagle is high up. It sees things from far away. It sees the forest, if you will. This is not Jesus. Hint. This is not Jesus. Okay. Now, here's what we're, I'm going to ask us to do, and that is, because this uh, works with any kind of problem, uh, object, or abstraction, the abstraction I'm putting in the center, that you are to... Um, Respond to the question, what is it that you see? Is begins with a C. Community. Community. 
Yes. What do you see? experiencing life together. They not only live as a group, but their relationships are marked by honesty. They experience joy as a group, and when pain plagues a member, they question, mourn, and heal together. While not all members may achieve closeness with all others, the honesty of, su of where such relationships are and what they need is spoken. Through living as a body, each member is able to challenge the others with perspectives and ideas. While such views will always vary, by walking together through life, each member is open and vulnerable with their own being and willing to accept accountability and encouragement. I'll send this to you via email rather than just putting it up on the board at the night at the moment. Okay. What else? I kind of had written down what she talked about was um, how we, if people challenge each other, um, so you just get greater results or strive for more because there's competition against that. Can I read what you wrote? Um, one has got some bullet points, I don't know. Um, Did you just say bullet points? Yeah. Are you a business manager? Yeah. Feel free to, to work together on this. I mean, you oh. don't have to filter through me. Got it. Well, I said a group of people united in a common theme. They work together and are willing to sacrifice for each other. Each, each person plays an important role in the group. Then I drew a picture of <laughs> seven happy people in a house. <laughs> successful community and an unsuccessful community. And I think most of those would be successful community or at least working towards something like that. Yeah, I kind of did something similar too. Um, I just wrote down a bunch of this kind of describing words and I noticed that um, I did a lot of things that were opposites of each other. So I think under the umbrella of community, it's not just, um, you know, just laughter or comfort or encouragement. It's also, you know, sadness and dissonance and um, just kind of this desperation and kind of a struggle to cooperate and because I think I don't know out of my experience even just thinking about like roommates living with roommates or living with my family it's not the community is not necessarily based on positive things it's also based on um, kind of how we interact with each other in a negative way as well so Kind of going with this, this entire list is towards good communities, not really evil communities. Like this is a beautiful, nice Christian community. What about your community of just thugs or people who want to go out and murder people on weekends? Mm -hmm. Or even just people that are in it for like their own personal benefit. I mean, community can be so many different things than just this good, wholesome thing that we're thinking of. So these are your, um, your beginnings. <coughs> first project is to try to answer the question, what is community? And experience that, uh, sort of the initial steps here. And some of the, sort of this, the conundrums that come with trying to do that. I have a question for you, uh, and this has to do with process. Most of you know each other from before, there are a couple of you that are new, and I'm certainly new, and one of the things that this process helps me with is to kind of get a sense of how you interact with each other, and that helps me in terms of figuring out 
how we need to proceed in terms of doing our group discussions with uh, the rest of the readings that we're going to be looking at. Um, so I noticed that uh, a number of you didn't volunteer. Uh, and I don't read that as you have nothing to say. I read that as um, there's a group dynamic here that says it takes a bit to kind of get over the threshold to be able to engage. Is that a fair reading of what was going on? Those of you who didn't share. And if it's not, let me know. Because sometimes communities think that there are groups of uh, people think that the, that uh, they're wide open and embracing and may not be, that may be that person's experience, it may not be everyone's experience. So, um, and, and we're, we're trying to make this a hospitable experience, this class. So, please feel free to connect with me. This is from uh, Chaim Potok's novel, In the Beginning. See, I'm, I'm, I've got a Potok thing, right? So, uh, all beginnings are hard. I can remember hearing my mother murmur these words while I lay in bed with fever. Children are often sick, darling. That's the way it is with children. All beginnings are hard. You'll be all right. I remember bursting into tears one evening because a passage of Bible commentary had proved too difficult for me to understand. I was about nine years old at the time. You want to understand everything immediately, my father said. Just like that? You only began to study this commentary last week. All the beginnings are hard. You have to work at the job of studying. Go over it again and again. The man who later guided me in my studies would welcome me warmly into his apartment and when we sat at his desk, say to me in his gentle voice, Be patient, David. The Midrash says all beginnings are hard. You cannot swallow all the world at one time. I say it to myself today when I stand before a new class at the beginning of a school year, or I'm about to start a new book or research paper. All beginnings are hard. Teaching the way I do is particularly hard, for I touch the rough, raw nerves of faith, the beginnings of things. Often students are shaken. I say to them what was said to me. Be patient. You are learning a new way of understanding the Bible. All beginnings are hard. And sometimes I add what I have learned on my own, especially a beginning that you make yourself. That's the hardest beginning of all. I felt the session was uh, informative for me, and uh, I will say the context had to do in part because it was the second session for the class. First session of the class, they were very upbeat and high energy and really excited about seeing each other because they, most of them have had a couple classes together. This is a honors cohort, and there were a couple people who aren't part of that group, but just a very different level of energy to uh, set up this uh, time. They were, um, I think, engaged, and uh, if I were to say, did I accomplish what I wanted to accomplish, I think the answer was not 100%, but we certainly made lots of progress, I think. And sometimes I find out later how things went for them. I think they were fairly quiet, uh, but I just had a professor in here this morning telling me that one of the people in the class was saying that she had had an aha moment in that classroom, and uh, for all intents and purposes, I couldn't have seen it, uh, but that's the kind of thing that we hope happens. I see my role in the community building process as this, and that is to provide a space 
uh, and a place uh, that is open, inviting. Um, one of the things that we are reading is uh, Peter Block's book on community, the structure of belonging, which I had them read for uh, read a little bit for that. And he talks about um, four conversations that need to happen: uh, the invitation, the possibility, uh, the ownership conversation, uh, the dissent conversation. Actually, there are five now, and the gifts conversation. I think my role is to provide the invitation uh, to facilitate the possibility questions, to do as much as I can to um, deflect ownership, because there's a tendency to want to make me the responsible one, but uh, try to keep giving it back to them, and uh, to help them begin to ask those questions about possibility and, and ownership, um, excuse me, possibility and uh, giftedness. Um, and then I think the dissent question is always difficult. I think we actually started that conversation in the classroom uh, yesterday in talking about no wrong answers. Um, later, I will be introducing the concept of, well, there may be several right answers, but there are going to be better answers. <laughs> um, there may be no wrong, you know, let me rephrase that. There may be... Um, there are no wrong answers, but there are better answers than others. And how do we get to that point of talking about what's a better answer? Um, so helping them uh, see, give them permission to uh, have dissent, to disagree with each other, uh, and to do that in a way that's honoring of their relationships. Boy, and if I, if we get them, if they get there. <laughs> Uh, that that's huge. Uh, I think that's huge. One of the things that was said yesterday was community is invisible. The concept it is certainly an abstract concept. Uh, and Brittany said something. Well, it's sort of like the wind. You see its effects, but you can't see the wind. Uh, and James kind of didn't want to buy on it bite too much on that one. But there is the same kind of thing, I think, in terms of community and how it has an impact on discussion. Uh, when people feel a connection, uh, a common purpose, uh, they feel safe with each other. Uh, and uh, as an aside, I would say that uh, people's sense of humor, their willingness to laugh together sometimes gives you a sense. Of laughter that isn't about uh, taking you off topic, but helps you uh, know that you are engaging with each other and enjoying each other, um, that kind of laughter. Uh, so I think learning happens at a deeper level and we're more open. When we're defensive, we don't take things in. Yeah. Uh, and community, I think, is a way to dissuade that defensiveness. Um, I belong. Uh, uh, this is, I, I'm doing things with people who also belong. I think you have to start with a really good question. If you don't start with a, a good question, it's, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. It's like the hardest part is taking, you know, getting, you use more energy getting a, a car moving from zero to ten miles an hour, I'm told, than it does to take a moving car and uh, get it to go faster. So just getting the discussion going is probably where I spend the most time trying to think about uh, what the question is. And then um, I think the other piece is uh, trying to find ways find the ideal for the personality and the engagement uh, in terms of numbers. You know, do we have discussions with between two or three people? Do we have discussions with six people? Do we go eight, twelve? 
do we try to have an entire class discussion with 24? Um, I don't, it, with this particular class, given what happened yesterday, I would say we're not ready for a full class discussion. Um, we'll probably um, make it four or five, something like that, next Tuesday, uh, and then build from there. The third thing is some sort of closure, some sort of uh, commitment to uh, share what is the essence of their discussions with the rest of the class. So uh, I will either try to have some, like I did yesterday, like some um, document that records the ideas that is then disseminated to everyone, uh, have them write a summary statement. There are multiple ways of doing this, but trying to find some way to bring things together uh, so that there's some sort of closure. And I think that's uh, key in terms of valuing uh, what it is that they are doing, not just go off and talk to each other. But there's a purpose here. One is certainly the willingness of the people to engage, of the students to engage. And if they don't want to engage with each other, uh, that's going to be an obstacle. Uh, if they don't think that uh, engaging with each other has value, that's an obstacle. If they think I have uh, ulterior motives, that's an obstacle. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I've learned over the years that I need to be transparent as much as possible about what I see, what's going on, uh, why I'm having them do what I'm having them do, um, to, to the point where I don't, you know, lead them uh, like lemmings or something, <laughs> but that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to say, you know, here, here's, here's the adventure. Here's the invitation. Uh, it's for you to, to accept or reject. And when people reject, particularly in a classroom, um, the, and the, the options are either you deal with that with them, or you, you what? They drop out. They. I mean, what? What other op opportunity or? Alternatives, that's the word. What other alternative do we have uh, for that? I would say that uh, the biggest obstacle is attitude. Uh, and when it's not an open attitude, when it's a closed attitude, when it's uh, a, a deprecating attitude, whether it's toward the class, whether it's toward the uh, members of the class, whether it's toward me, Sometimes it's toward themselves, too, so. I tend to um, spend some sleepless nights sometimes. Um, how do I engage with this person? Uh, and I will, you know, my background is counseling psychology, so I'm, I'm there trying to figure out how to help this person, how to engage with this person, how to, is, is it possible to do a, an attitude uh, check or change? Uh, and, you know, I find that just patience, waiting, giving them the space to come around. And I've had some marvelous uh, successes and some marvelous <laughs> failures, too, <laughs> that, uh, and if one thing doesn't work, then I'll try to come up with another. But generally it's through uh, a relational uh, connection and also trying to find the interests of the student that can get hooked um, and I, that are relevant, certainly. But uh, what really matters to this person? They don't like community for what reason? Um, they don't want to be involved with these other students, and I could tell stories, but um, 
like the student who says, I don't really have time for this class because it's not in my major and I want to go into get into med school and I don't see how this is going to be valuable to me. That told me a lot and that helped me figure out how I needed to uh, engage with him at that time. So. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, answer comes through some of the work that we did in Spectrum and the lesson that less is more. That we can move farther and faster with content if we have that space where people are willing to engage with each other. Uh, so as a group, uh, they move more quickly with the you know, basic knowledge and comprehension, understanding piece, and move more quickly into being able to do analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And I'm quoting um, Benjamin Bloom here. Uh, when we take the time to build up. And I'll also add that one of the things that we read is uh, M. Scott Peck's book called The Different Drum in Community. And he believes that community, authentic community, real community, and this is one of the things that we debate, uh, can happen in a marathon weekend. So if he thinks that it can happen in 48 hours, how much time do I get you know, over the course of a, a semester? And maybe just spending a little bit of time on this, you know, five minutes uh, a, day, a classroom, uh, a class, can make all the difference in the world.